While getting out of the home is difficult as we get older and disabled, visits to the doctors and the dentists don't all have to be drab. I make the most of outings as much now as I did when I was young, and on my way back from the doctors we visited the gardens, and in Bendigo, as the weather warms up, the Tulip Festival is about and all of these tulips are just emerging in now in late September early October well worth a visit and of course uh, I painted them in my younger days one of the most difficult things about aging I'm finding is having people accept that I am retired I am no longer the fine artist that I once was um, people can't seem to understand that I am not a fine artist anymore. Sure, I work at a hobby business and it's very much a hobby, doing as much as I can to keep active. If the Arthritis Foundation says if you don't use it, you lose it. And I do my very best to continue using everything I can. And at the end of this video, I will include a professional standard tutorial from the past not what I am doing now. And when my husband and I ran Bananyon Gallery, we did have an award-winning garden and it featured many tulips. House, wildlife photographer. And I've got tulips double tulips in the foreground with hyacinths behind that was gifted to me by um, Margaret Lake, a historical romance writer. And the rest of the image, the plants, they're from my own cottage garden. So it's a real assortment of friends, images and my own inspiration from my garden. And it's great to start a painting when you've got inspiration, something real and maybe some reference photographs that are legal for you to use don't copy off the internet unless you've got permission from the person who's taken the photo it's much better to have um well researched material i'm working with artist quality watercolor paints they're beautifully transparent and they're also permanent pigments they're of a high quality and wonderful to work with i'm working with a quality piece of watercolour paper and not a particularly expensive piece it's only a medium lightweight sheet it's Watman's paper which is not my favourite but it is um, you know good it's um, student to professional quality and you can see how transparent this paint is it's not covering the paper it's you can see the white glow of the paper through it you see how I splash the paint around the first thing to overcome is the fear of the paper uh, I've started off with a drafted sketch of the main features the double tulips are very complex in shape so it was worth taking some time to sketch them out well now if you have trouble sketching don't worry that doesn't stop you getting straight stuck into painting you know you could put a thin piece of paper over your computer screen and with a pencil that's not going to damage your computer screen very lightly sketch you know by having your computer on the highest um, brightness level dimming the lights around you you can get the image showing through and you can sketch another way you can do things is you could hold a um, perhaps print the image out onto a piece of photocopy paper you can hold that photocopy paper up onto a glass um, panel window when the sun's behind and put another sheet of paper over and you can draw using it and of course you can go and spend five hundred dollars or more or on a light box there's many ways that you can draw something out before you've learned the drawing skills so don't ever lose use um the problem that you haven't yet learned how to draw well as a thing to hold you back from painting. As long as you've got yourself a good plan and you could call it a map, a, a map of what the flower looks like, you can do yourself a flower and it's a case of putting in that lovely transparent background. The lemon yellow is a great place to start with a brightly lit flower. 
then go in and put in your mid-tones and your darks into the deep shadow areas and you can progressively work through a flower now you can wet the whole paper in which case when you paint the flower the flower is going to bleed out and you'll have that can work quite well as suggesting flowers behind the plant or in the case of this painting I've started on dry paper and I've just put the paint onto the flower shape itself. Now this paper as I said is not one of the best quality it's not um, very heavily sized so it's drying out very quickly so it's not allowing me to get beautiful bleeding effects of one colour into another as perhaps if I was working on um, my better quality Fabriano at Dispico papers for instance so this is the Watman and when I go and put this next layer of the medium dark tone down the underpainting is completely dry so I'm not getting the beautiful graduated bleeds you know ideally I'd have put my lemon yellow down and then I'd gone in and I'd put my beautiful it's a red orange a muted red orange that I'm putting in now I put that down and it would sort of bleed and graduate into the lemon yellow and you'd get um, many tones happening just from the water doing it that's of course the beauty of watercolor is you can drop a darker color in over a lighter color and you'll get this lovely bleeding of tones so I'm not getting that effect with this painting so I'm not getting the beautiful watercolourly effect but I'll still end up with quite a nice painting with this but I'm just describing to you the difference from my having chosen to work on Watman paper to if I had chosen to work on a higher quality paper um, a lot of people use ash as I do have some ash but it's not my favorite but it's quite a good quality and that's you know if you've got ash that's fine but um, your paper will make a difference so it's going to take some time because it's a very complex flower this double tulip and not something you'd be rushed and this is the tutorial side I do have um, some demonstrations of this on YouTube I've actually put up five shorter videos on YouTube of my progress through this painting if you want to look them up it's the Wampu Fruit Dove and you'll find them on YouTube if you just want the quick shorter versions that are just demonstration but I'm striving to do this as a longer tutorial for people who really want to try to follow and learn what I've done so as I said it doesn't matter what the flower is give yourself a good sketch of your main flower or group of flowers you don't have to draw everything into it a lot of what you put down will be abstract out of focus and just suggested but perhaps you might want one or a couple of leaf flowers where you've defined the shape and again splash when you finish with the color feel confident to splash it around the more you can overcome your fear of the paper the blank paper the better and all of that splashing will just suggest stuff happening in the background that's out of focus now I'm going in and suggesting some of the um, leaves now now the tulip leaf this is what this is it's got a distinctive shape and I've drawn it in so that I actually define the shape of the tulip it's also a bluish green so I've used some cerulean blue which I've mixed with a lemon yellow and because I'm mixing my yellow sorry mixing my green rather than taking green out of a tube I can vary the color and also the light and shade intensity of it depending where I put it down so I'll be putting in a range of leaves into this painting again splashing it around suggesting stuff that's happening there but slightly out of focus what I like about um, this procedure here where I'm putting the leaves in is how varied these leaves are in the color and tone it really lifts the painting at this point it makes it um, define the painting faster than anything that I've done prior to this the shapes are quite distinctive of these leaves and as I said I did take care to sketch them in as per the photograph I didn't need to change them much but after I've done this first layer of 
leaves, I've relaxed. <laughs> it's very important to relax when you're doing a painting. I've relaxed, I've gained confidence and I'm able to just sort of throw in <laughs> ad libs some more leaves where I feel they're going to look really good for the painting. And that works too. Now, these um, leaves are not as transparent looking as the flowers because the cerulean blue is semi-opaque the lemon yellow was more transparent looking so you've got a um, less transparency to the leaves and also I've come in very dramatic here this is suggesting the hyacinths in the background it's very darkly dark I'm depending on the fact that when you put watercolor down it generally dries lighter and um, you know, I put that in pretty strong. It didn't have to go in as strong as I put it, but it will work for me as I'll show you later in the painting when I am able to lighten it up. But uh, it was a little bit of a shocking um, jar to the composition going in so strong at that stage up there in the painting. A little bit of out of context with the remainder of the painting, but we'll pull it all together before the end. It's important to keep your eye on all of the painting not finish off any one part of the painting um, that can be that can make the painting look very amateurish if you're trying to detail one part of the painting um, you work generally all over the whole painting and of course that's why um, mediums like watercolor oil painting is perhaps easier to get a good result with than acrylics because with acrylics um, you're trying to perhaps mimic watercolour technique and you're doing so with a less transparent medium so it's not as easy to get that good transparency um, a wash effects in acrylic as it is with watercolour or you're trying to duplicate an oil painter's technique and of course you've got paint that's drying fast therefore you can't work all over the painting and um, come back and blend later or add to later with the subtlety that you can get with oils and that is why acrylic medium is a very versatile medium which can be used to do watercolor technique or oil painting technique but it doesn't do either as well as if you used oil or watercolor but I still love the medium if you're using artist quality because you can get very close to what you'd get with those mediums and you do have the convenience of the paint that's quick drying. So moving on, just diversifying a little bit to explain the difference between different mediums. So um, if I was working with this using acrylic, uh, the only difference so far would be that my lemon yellow would not be so transparent and glowing. And perhaps the subtlety of that beautiful cerulean blue in the tulip leaf would not be quite as um, luminous and pretty as it is using with a watercolour but um, I certainly could have done it with an artist quality acrylic paint if that was what I had. Um, gouache is a very useful medium which is opaque watercolour but I would save gouache for final touch-ups final intense details, bright colours like the red in a rosella or something like that. I wouldn't um, try to do a whole painting with gouache if I had the option of use a transparent watercolour at the beginning. Transparent watercolour is just beautiful to work with. You just need to relax and as I said, the better the quality of the paper, the easier it will be. Again, splash that colour around. I didn't splash around as much when I was younger in my watercolours. It's becoming um, very much accepted by watercolourists these days to splatter around. <laughs> Whereas um, back in the 70s and 80s, it was more or less a new technique that people were starting to do. It wasn't something that everybody did in their painting. Whereas now, I think 90% of watercolourists are happily splashing around and it does look good it does um, suggest you know this is watercolor and uh, I love it so there you go I've, I'm starting to do it with all my watercolors dripping allowing the paint to drip and leaving the drips there without catching them and picking them up that's another lovely trait that just shows that this is a watercolor 
as I said, these um, hyacinths I'm putting in are a little bit dark and a little bit heavy in tone, but um, <laughs> bear with me, I make them work later on, as you'll see. But uh, it's probably um, a little bit scary putting them in this dark at the moment because they jar the composition. And generally, I'm thinking of the whole composition all the way I go and building things up steadily and equally. Having put those in so dark, this is where I ad lib now and I go in and confidently put in some leaves and I see how one bends over there, that's sort of automatic, you're thinking, you're thinking nature, you can't, you paint nature, you need to become familiar with nature, you're painting flowers, become a gardener, don't just shop your flowers in a florist shop. You know how they grow the flowers in the flor for the florist shop? All perfect, you know, the stems are straight, everything is controlled. You don't want controlled flowers, you want, you want your work to look like nature. So become familiar and then when you go to paint something, if you don't have that reference right there in front of you, or if the reference in front of you is a little bit too arranged, you can just ad lib it'll just come to you you'll see how the leaf goes up and you know the wind has bent it moved it you never want to paint things too perfectly if you're trying to make it look like nature i've become a little bit more green rather than blue green in the foliage as i said by varying the amount of lemon yellow to cerulean blue I've been able to get a lovely variety of colorings and tones within the um, foliage, which is working quite well. We've got two different types of plants so far. We have the hyacinth and the tulip. So we've basically started with the flowers that were in focus. You could have started with the background and moved forward. I've started with the ones that are in focus and I'm um, gradually moving backwards. And even with these flowers that are in focus, I don't develop all of them to a really finished form. I'm suggesting more hyacinths into the painting here. I'm not putting them in as heavy as the first two. I'm suggesting them with more water on my brush, just a hint of them in the middle distance. And this is helping balance up the composition balance up my colorings and again looking at the whole painting and thinking now where do you need to put more hyacinths or whatever flowers they are that soft blue gray blue violet grayed back coloring where does that need to go in this painting to balance the composition if you're not sure, squint at the work and look at the pattern of light and shade. That's what you're creating, a pleasing, asymmetrical design of light and shade. I'm building up a few more darks in it. Again, I've got to make it work with what I've already put in. So you need to have the suggestion of what's in focus in the foreground, going back, going out of focus as you go back into the middle distance and then out of focus in the distance. So even a bouquet of flowers that might only be like, you know, a couple of feet or half a meter deep, you need to get that feeling of that three dimension. You need to get the feeling that you could put your hand into that bunch of flowers. You're painting on a two dimensional surface, but it's important that you get that feeling of depth. It's called aerial perspective. Lineal perspective is how the foreground tulip looks larger than the tulip that's recessed back into the middle distance and smaller again than one that will be in the distance. Aerial perspective is giving the impression of the layers of air between you and your subject and you need to exaggerate and imagine those layers of air are like a, a veil, a, a transparent veil that's dropped between you and the subject and with each layer of depth you go back there's another layer of veil you're looking through so that the work is becoming more and more out of focus as it goes back and by doing that you're giving the illusion of that depth and it works really well using aerial perspective in a painting. 
perhaps much easier to do when you're looking far back into the distance to distant mountains to give that effect because you can see the changes in colour with your eyes when you're just trying to paint a bouquet of flowers. It makes all the difference between whether it looks amateurish and the painting just looks like it's flat across the page or whether you've got that feeling of depth in the work. Now this isn't something that you can hurry. I've given myself a complex subject, flowers with a lot of detail. It's not something you can just whack together, you know. That amount of painting that I've just done has probably taken me over an hour, but the timing that I've shown it on the video has been about 20 minutes. Here I'm showing you my watercolour pencils. Now I've also got a, a knife here, it's an exacto knife or if you like a scalpel it's got a scalpel blade in it and I'm going in and I'm scratching out highlights where I put dark in the hyacinths now this is fixing the problem I had of having put down my hyacinths too dark I could have painted and left the areas that were to be the light highlights as just the white paper and if they were larger spaces of white or light it would have been easy to do this but because with this highlight hyacinth these specks of highlights are just going to be the tiny little bits on the upper tips of the petals it was possibly easier to just simply paint the whole thing dark and then go in and because i've got enough quality texture on my paper I could just remove little high points of the paper using the point of the scalpel knife and that's what I'm doing I'm flicking off bits of paper <laughs> and uh, you can see I'm creating a little bit of pigment and dust from these little paper shards so again you need to safely dispose of this don't go blowing it and getting dust and pigmentation in the air where you're going to breathe it um, push it aside gently and uh, make sure you catch all of that rubbish and dispose of it uh, always work safely you don't want to be breathing and inhaling toxic dust in your studio you don't want family members having to breathe it so this is working really well for me just the pointed tip of the exacto knife this is a part of my demonstrations on youtube that people loved they hadn't seen it done very much but it, uh, I've been perhaps doing a little bit of um, stafito work, scratching out work with my watercolours for as long as I've been watercolouring. I don't know who taught me this technique, but uh, it's one that I love and uh, it works really well if you're working with good quality paper. The better the quality of the paper, particularly rough paper, which is usually the cold pressed papers, there's a texture there so you're just really taking off the high points of the paper in a few spots to bring that light through. My X-Acto knife is not a particularly um, sharp one. I haven't bought a new one in years and uh, perhaps I need to. But it's doing the job. You can see here I'm scratching out the highlight edge on the leaf. Now this is superb for that. There's no way I could have put down a line of masking fluid as fine as this line that I can achieve with the point of a scalpel. So to scratch out a very fine, a very fine twig, a very fine highlight on a branch or on this flower, the exacto knife or the scalpel is just excellent. So I do love this technique. I think I've said that. <laughs> Uh, now I can also go into the middle distance and do this um, not as much because we don't want as much detail again the aerial perspective and I'm going in with the watercolour pencils now I want to show you watercolour pencils because this is a white or a creamy coloured watercolour pencil it means that it's got a little opacity to it so we can put an opaque suggestion of some of the brighter hyacinth flowerets. I think they're, they're called flowerets when you've got a whole group of tiny little flowers all together. And it's really defining the shape and form of the hyacinth. So watercolour pencil is a marvellous aid to have 
Um, only something that I've worked with a lot recently, again, because it's a medium that's popular on YouTube for people to want to learn. A lot of people have pencils these days and a lot of people have watercolour pencils and want to know a little bit more about how to use them. I could use gouache, which is an opaque watercolour, and do this again with the gouache and use put it on with a fine tipped brush, which is what I would have used mostly in the past. But um, I have the Coran d'Arche watercolour pencils, which are, in my opinion, the world's best. They've got the maximum pigment saturation. Prior to having the Coran d'Arche, um, I was using the Faber-Castell, um, the Brunzeel, which are lovely, uh, but none of them are as good as this brand. This has just made a big difference in my wanting to use watercolour pencils as a general medium in many of my watercolour works for this type of fine work, rather than going to the gouache and a brush. Very handy. You now you can point them up with a pencil sharpener. You can use the shavings to sprinkle on to wet paper for a lovely speckled effect. Nothing's wasted. Going in and suggesting more of the little darks, that blue violet that I've used, I can use it for lines on the foliage because there will be blue violets in the shadows of those greens. If you are using a colour in one part of your painting, while you've got that colour on your brush or in your hand on a, in a pencil form, look where else that particular colour or tone goes. Okay? It makes all the difference and it pulls everything into this nice harmony. This is why you don't finish one part of the painting on its own in isolation. You look at your whole painting. I've got this blue violet, grayed back blue violet in my hand. Where else do I apply it? And it goes a little bit in the flower, a little bit in the leaf, a little bit in the background. And you're getting yourself a colour harmony moving through your whole painting. You're working on maintaining the composition of the painting all the way through. Nothing's happening in isolation. Nothing's jarring. So, as I said, while it's in your hand, you put it everywhere where you think it belongs. While you, And, um, yeah, it just... Well, it's a lovely medium to work with. How much you detail and how much you leave a work loose and free is entirely your personal taste. The main thing is you don't detail all your painting or you have an amateurish looking work. If you want to get that beautiful aerial perspective, you need to leave quite a lot out of focus. You need to get that feeling of layers of air. So it's best to not detail all of the work but you can detail a lot in some areas in the foreground if you wish to i'm tending to prefer a little bit of balance between realism and impressionism so i don't like to over detail in fact i'm quite happy to leave these flowers for you to guess are they double tulips are they something else it's not important I'm actually going to be putting a bird into the painting and he's going to be the major focal point of the painting. I just like you to get the feeling of this lovely rural garden. And um, I'm not trying to overly define these and say, look, these are double tulips. I'm not over defining the flowers at the back and saying these are hyacinths. If you want to wonder if they're buddleia or some other plant, that's fine. It, uh, the feeling is capturing the impression of the subject, the, the painting as a whole, rather than stating clearly what every piece of painting is. As I said, I've got the Wampu Fruit Dove as my, going to be my main feature. I didn't know it at this stage. Um, what happened was the wildlife photographer sent me some beautiful photographs of his birds and uh, I went through them and as soon as I saw the Wampu Fruit Dove, I recognised in it many of the colourings that I'd put into this painting and um, I knew I needed to keep detailing this painting up a little and as soon as I saw that bird, I just said, that's it, that's it, <laughs> I was so excited and it worked so perfectly within this scene. Again, see, I'm still 
looking where can this color go i'm working with a dark a grayed back or muted tone of blue violet and there are just so many areas that that blue violet works and they're not even in a blue violet flower or blue violet leaf it's all to do with creating the tone of the shadows the shape of the shadows and it's in harmony if I had gone and used a um, dark orange a dark yellow say a dark brown to use for the shadows in this flower I would not have had the pleasing color harmony the pleasing natural look that I get by using the same dark shadow that I've got in my hyacinth flower Here I've drawn in my Wampu Fruit Dove and I'm coming in and I'm sketching it using the pencils, the watercolour pencils. And of course I'm also developing some of the foliage that will be around it, all around it, because I'm extending out the composition by putting a fairly large bird in, I need to extend out my composition of the whole painting. As I said, nothing happens in isolation in a painting. If you change your composition in one area, you have to look to see how that might apply within another area. When I use some of that colouring, I'm using a red violet at the moment, I look and see where else that red violet is used in the painting. At the moment, we're basically just colouring in with this watercolour pencil. It will change when I add water to it. And while I have that pencil, I then go and apply pieces in other bits of the painting. The red violet worked into the blue violet hyacinth. I'm working with green on the bird, I'm working with green in my background, suggesting foliage. Again, the bird would in nature be hiding amongst foliage as camouflage. So the colourings of the bird are picked up in the surroundings. That's how birds survive. Again, because it's a bird, a large bird, it's um, one of the largest rainforest birds in southeastern Australia. I'm needing to increase the um, dimensions of this painting so that it doesn't overpower the painting but it works within the painting composition so we're extending the painting right out now there's less white background around that's a very bright violet that i'm using very intense violet shade you'll see the intensity more when i add water there's a luminosity to the bird i'm putting in some of the shadows there when i add water to this i'll spread this around because i've got to get a contour to this bird's head it's the bird's head it's you know it's curved you know it's like an oval shape and at the moment we've just got a flat surface you know so when we add the water to it we've got to curve this we've got to make that bird's head look like it curves out this is going to be done with light and shade and also with direction now the bird's head is all the one color it's not all these different colors that i'm putting in but as i said you need to have those shadows and and the shadows need to have that blue violet tone to them because that's the shadow color that i'm using throughout the whole painting the green is very luminous on the bird brighter than it will be on the um, foliage so I'm using a true green the green on the foliage the tulips and the hyacinths I mix the green using the lemon yellow and the cerulean blue when I put the green down for the bird I'm using a primary green a bright green direct from the pencil tip lovely bright lime greens and the um, strong true greens and I'm also adding this subtly into the foliage, not to, to a great extent. In fact, um, when I add water to the foliage that I've just put into the landscape, it comes up too bright. 
and I have to go and I put something opaque over it, just subdue it. I could have um, mixed my greens for the foliage. See how I'm trying to curve that. Again, okay, see how bright this comes. When I add the water to the watercolour paper, it's to the watercolour pencil, it's like emulsifying pigment and it's intensely brilliant. Intensely brilliant. It's going to be too brilliant for the foliage. Again, see I'm adding water now to the blue violet and the red violet on the bird's body and it's really beautifully brilliant. Just what I want. You know, this bird has luminous tone. See how I diffuse this now into the bird's neck. Just fade it away because I've got a little water. Bef I wet that neck before and so I'm able to fade that colouring out. Working a little bit of watercolour pencil directly onto the wet paper. Getting a little bit of lemon reflections into suggesting that this has feathers so that you've got little highlights within this red and blue violet. I'm doing that with the use of the lemon pencil. As I said, I used to always do this sort of work with a fine tip brush. And I'm needing to make this um, head more defined. It's, uh, it was a light bird's head against a light background and I need this bird to stand out more. So I have darkened the background. But my choice of pigment is very bright. I don't want the background to be more important than the bird. So I'll go back later and I will subdue the colour of the background behind the bird. I don't want it to shriek a blue violet like that. I just want it to represent shadow. And you can see how these greens, when I wet them, they shriek out at me. I don't want bright, strong greens showing. I'm doing them back a little bit with violet now to take some of the intensity out of the green. We still have something that's far too strong. So we're now using a semi-opaque pigment there a little bit of opacity to it and we're going over those two bright greens and the two bright violets with a little bit of opacity to our paint in other words a bit of gouache you could do that by adding a little bit of an opaque white to any of the watercolors or you could have gouache i think i'm using a um, slightly lemon tinted gouache here so it's an opaque paint that i'm putting down to subdue what i've previously put down that was too bright so they say you can't change watercolour, you can change it a little bit. You can't change your transparent washes, but you can certainly change background areas. Parts that aren't primary focus areas you can change because it doesn't matter if they are slightly opaque. And again, I'm still trying to reduce the colour intensity, the cried bright chroma of those background areas. I've got them too intense. That's working for me much better now. And again, I'm putting that um, wonderful creamy yellow violet muted tones all around this background. It's working with the brighter transparent colours that are within the painting. It's repeating them as it goes further out without the um, brightness of the transparency. It's suggesting a feeling of bush. We've got a bird, a rainforest bird here. So we're suggesting that this garden is the edge of a bush scene and you've got the depth of looking into the bush. You get the feeling of light appearing in little glimpses through clumps of foliage. As I said, you, can, you do this by watching the whole painting getting in here in the tiny little areas between the foliage and the flowers and suggesting the density of the bush all the way through, looking for little bits where you get that feeling of depth coming through between the flowers. So we have here, we have transparent watercolour, we have staffido effect, where we've scratched back to the paper 
Then we have artist quality watercolour pencils, which could have also have been gouache applied with a fine brush tip. And then we've got some opaque watercolour or gouache applied last. So it's quite a um, few different mediums, but they all come back to the water-based paint. They're all watercolour, both opaque and transparent watercolour. It's a wampu fruit dove, giving a suggestion of it in a rural garden. So you've got the cottage garden effect at the beginning and the Australian bush suggestion coming through at the back. And, oh, colour harmony. Yeah, as long as I kill back some of that intense muted bright shade with some more muted tones over the top, more opaque tones over the top, I'm very pleased with this. There is actually a few bright greens in rainforest, so just, um, just muting back these bright greens a little bit. It's going to work. If you've got any questions, you're very welcome to ask. I'll try to answer all of them. Watching that composition, you don't want any lines leading you out of your painting. You want your eye to wander around the painting. Don't rush. Don't ever rush. There's no rush. There's no need to rush it. You do a certain amount of painting, put your brush down and go and have a break. Come back, you look at it afresh. Well, writers do that. You write um, a first draft, you set it aside, you forget about it. You come back and then you can look at it afresh and you can do your second draft. But you can't just charge straight into your second draft while you're focusing on every sentence. You've got to be able to look at the whole thing. If you try to keep on working on a painting, you're focusing on the last brush stroke you did and you're assessing, did that brush stroke work? You've got to forget about the brush strokes. You've got to have a break, go away, come back and look at the whole painting and ask the painting, what does it need? And that when you ask a painting, what does it need? And it doesn't tell you anything, it's when it's done. Sometimes you might think, well, it needs something, but I don't know what. So you don't just start going in hodgepodge and thinking, well, I could put a butterfly in it, or I could put this in it, or, you know, you could have a fairy landing on <laughs> you, you, You don't rush in and say, well, I could do this, I could do that. You wait, you go through a stage of the painting of what is called more look than put, where you're just quietly, you know, setting the painting up where you could see it, going past, glancing at it now and then, still have that feeling that it needs something but you don't quite know what. This is where I saw the fruit dove and I knew the fruit dove was what this painting needed. I didn't just rush in and throw something else into the painting. I waited until I knew for sure what this painting needed. And now I worked the whole painting. See that bright colours in that fruit dove? I'm now pulling that. There's some of those lovely let me see, red violet. So I'm putting some red violet into these double tulips. The double tulips didn't have red violet in them, but I'm putting it there. I'm putting it there in a mid-tone in the form of a red violet and pink, if you like. And it's working quite well. It's pulling up some of the colour that's in that bird that hadn't been in those flowers, but would work very well in those flowers suggesting a little bit of that particular colouring, the mid-tone version of that red violet that's in the bird, I'm suggesting it back in the distance. What is it? Is it the berries of uh, one of the rainforest trees? Is it flowers? Is it a little bit of red violet from an evening sunset? It doesn't matter. It's picking up a colour that we've used in the painting, looking at the whole composition and suggesting it into the painting in various places where it will work. This comes from relaxing, enjoying what you're doing, just looking at your whole painting, asking the painting what it needs, 
It needed that red violet repeated around the painting just subtly, just a little bit. And as we're doing it, we're watching the whole painting, not just where we're working, so that we know when to stop. We know when enough is enough. What does it need? Enjoy doing it. Suggesting a little definition of shape in a few areas. Again, keep working with the colour while it's on you, in your hand. Now I come in with my fine brush and I'm wetting parts of this watercolour paint. Again, I'm trying to contour this shadow to try to get that bird that dove's face more rounded trying to get that contouring into that dove's face i'm touching those sharp dark details on the eyes and the beak with a point of a wet brush i'm going with a point of the wet brush into an opaque watercolor it looks like a naples yellow or a similar color and i'm going in and putting in no the bright it, it looks like a bright strong yellow I'm putting in opaque I'm putting it on direct straight from the tube I could have used watercolor pencil but I guess I wouldn't have got as intense a color in one application by going into the paint straight out of the tube I've got more intensity of color here I'm obviously still wanting to grey back some of that original color the blue violet the yellow so I'm putting an opaque watercolour over the top of it and then trying to blend it slightly. And here I'm suggesting wattle. Again, the colour is in the bird, the colour is in the flowers. I'm moving it around, suggesting it more into the painting. Whatever colour I've used in the painting, I want it to become part of the whole painting, not just one area with the main subject being in primary focus so I can't paint this wattle without keeping my eye on the bird it's very important to watch that whole painting so that you don't overdo one area if I just looked at the wattle I could end up with a clump of wattle up in the top corner there in sharp focus taking over and dominating the rest of the painting rather than just being an enhancement of the whole composition I've been working with pure sable brushes. Now I like my pure sable brushes. I tend to use Kalinsky sable, which is the world's best quality sables, Russian Kalinsky. Um, I will be using a quality brand. And the brushes will always tip up beautifully. Being pure sable, regardless of the size, they will carry a lot of fluid wash the natural hair will soak up the fluid and will carry a lot more. If you were to use a synthetic brush, you might be able to get a good point, but you will not be able to carry the amount of liquid or paint in that brush as you can with the natural hairs. They are doing a lot with natural hairs these days and they've greatly improved, but they still don't beat the pure Kalinsky sable for watercolor or even for the um, larger paintings I tend to use a mop brush and I'll use Pettigris Pearl which is a very high quality squirrel the very tip of the <laughs> squirrel tail makes a beautiful brush comes to a beautiful point carries a lot of wash is ideal for working on a large painting because you can do large washes and come right up onto the tip to do your fine details so you can do your whole painting with one brush if i'm working with the sables i tend to use um, a medium large one to start with and i might come down use about three different sizes if you can only afford to spend a bit on your watercolour brushes better to buy one good brush 
a size seven is a good size. You can do fine tip work with it. You can do some um, larger wash work with it and uh, build on from there. But you don't need many watercolour brushes, but you do need good quality to have the control of the tip work and to be able to carry a lot of liquid in that brush. Synthetics just don't cut it for watercolour, for me anyway. I'll use synthetic brushes for my acrylic painting because um, acrylic paint is harsher on the brushes. It doesn't clean out as easily. You might be leaving your brushes in to soak in the water a lot more. If you have any paint left in the brush, it'll dry hard and be a lot harder to get out. So I rarely, I won't say I never, but I rarely use my very high quality expensive Kalinsky sables for an acrylic painting. Um, although they do a beautiful job, it's just that um, the medium can be very harsh on them and they are never as nice to work with for acrylic, for, sorry, for watercolour again, after you've used them for your acrylic painting. I used to keep special watercolour brushes, Kalinsky sable brushes, only for my acrylic paints and know that once I'd used them for the acrylic paint they were useless as, as a good watercolour paint as brush but I used to um, make sure that I kept them in water the um, tips of them at least until I was ready to give them a really thorough clean out. You need to be very disciplined in looking after your brush as well. Spend your money on good quality brushes and just ensure that you care for them well and you've got them for a lifetime. You certainly have, I have um, invested in quality Kalinsky Sable brushes when I was about 11 years old, when I was first started having lessons from extremely top quality art tutors. Um, I attended um, Swinburne Tech evening classes with uh, advanced artists and I studied under a win prize winner and a um, Archibald Prize Portrait Prize finalist and I saved my money, I worked, I didn't get given the money, I didn't get given the supplies, I worked and earned them and I bought myself pure Kalinsky sable brushes and I've still got them. <laughs> so what's that, it's over 60 years old those brushes are and they still perform for me. They don't drop hairs. I bought good in the first place, cared for them and they've lasted. Um, if you're not going to use them for a long time, you know, um, stick a few mothballs in the container. Um, moths love them too, so you keep that in mind with natural hair brushes. They're not brushes to just be um, put away and forgotten about. <laughs> I've never had moths get at my brushes, but it's something that can be a nasty shock if you, if you go through a period of time where work stops you painting. Uh, just take a little bit of um, precaution with them, same as you would a good suit. You can see I'm working up on a tip. It's not a very fine brush. It's probably about a size six, but I can get the same fine point that I could get if I was working with a triple O brush just by having a quality brush that will point up well. I can do fine twig work. And that's what this painting needed now. I'm probably using the blue violet that I've got in that bird, which is very, very dark tone. And I will have grayed it back so that these twigs don't shriek blue violet. So the opposite of blue is orange. So a very dark orange might be burnt sienna. And the opposite to violet is yellow. So a very dark yellow might be burnt umber. So I, by either mixing something like burnt umber or burnt sienna, a dark red orange or a dark yellow, which those browns are, into the blue violet, I'm able to get the very dark tone that I want of these brush branches and a subtle variation of the branches going from 
the burnt sienna, the burnt amber, through to the blue violet. You're getting this range of browns, red browns to blue violets within the branch, which is what happens in nature. It's all very subtle and the colour is muted. So because it's a mixture of these colours, so it never shrieks out colour to you, but there'll be subtle variations in the colouring as well as subtle variations in tone, just as you see in nature. There'll be little areas where you hardly see the branch because it's going through an area where the light might strike it. And so it will become the same bright tones as the background where the sun's hitting it. It might also be an area where you scratch it out so they just get pure white of the paper, suggesting the lighting has hit it. You're not going to have the branches being this dark muted tone everywhere because it will depend on where your light is coming through. Again, notice I'm not rushing this. Take your time. A good painting takes time. And always watch that whole painting. You're watching that pattern of light and shade you're watching the composition, you're watching the colour harmony. You're keeping an eye that you're developing the aerial perspective, the feeling of depth in the painting. Keeping your eye on that main focal point, which is going to be the dove, then the foreground flowers, then you go to the middle distance, through the distance and your eyes should wander through this painting finding new things to see and appreciate and enjoy the more your eye can wander through a painting discovering things the more pleasing that painting is to the eye the more you can just sit there and enjoy looking at it if everything's stated in one hard bang here everything is there everything is stated everything is in sharp focus you get very bored with looking at that. You need that variety again. Back pulling in that blue violets that are in the bird. Making them appear in the leaves, in the foliage. As I said, you're building the whole painting. Never just one spot. I know I keep repeating myself, but that's how you learn. It's hearing it over and over again. I don't expect you to pick things up in one go. I certainly didn't. It's a repetition of hearing it said by your teacher. And you're getting the contouring of the, the leaves there with contrasting of light and shade. And you're getting the curving of a leaf, the moving of a leaf. Where, where would the shadow hit that leaf? Now I had a choice, I worked at one point, you saw, I worked with the pencils and now I'm into where I'm in my natural element working with a brush. You can see I love working with the brush. By pushing the brush down a little bit harder, I get a wider brush stroke. By lifting it off, I come up off onto a tip. I'm suggesting, barely suggesting, extra leaves behind. I'm running my brush over a dampened leaf and I'm almost picking up pigment off of that leaf and then I'm hinting it down somewhere else. Building up depth. So, yes, I'm more of a natural with a brush than with a pencil. I'll always love the brush first. You can do so much more with it. Increasing those darks in that, if you, I want to make something look brighter, lighter I may do it by making something darker alongside it by sheer contrast it will then appear brighter and lighter you can't make something brighter or lighter than the paper will allow but you can get something darker alongside it and it'll jump out more by contrast and this is how I'm building this foreground into closer sharper intensity and again I won't want to do this to every one of these flowers or even to every petal within a flower but I love the shaping in the center of these flowers 
And this was a spot to get in and increase those little bits of dark to show all those tiny little petal forms of the double tulip. That was worth taking that little bit of extra time in there. And again, back, I've enhanced the flower. I need to go back and increase the intensity of contrast in the bird. So you work one area up, you need to go back and work another area up. Everything in context. Nothing happening in isolation in the painting. I'll do a lot of demonstrations for YouTube. Uh, most of them are no longer than 15 minutes. Um, often with just a music background and minimal explanation. And I'll do more of these tutorials which will be available from my website. So these are aimed for the person who wants to learn art rather than just the entertainment of watching somebody paint. Try to explain as I go. To make one colour brighter, one puts in more muted tones beside it. So some tones, some colourings are bright, high colour intensity or high chroma, and some colours are muted. I have to say I really enjoyed doing this painting. Watercolour, even for me, after, well, it's been more than 60 years because I started painting seriously when I was seven. Uh, I um, started trying to learn art when I was seven. Walter Foster had a paint books is where I started. <laughs> well, in the actual self-taught lessons. I guess I started by being fortunate enough to having um, an Archibald Prize winning artist um, as part of our family friendship base. My um, auntie married into the um, McGuinness family seven times Archibald Prize winning artist in the family brilliant um, flower painter in Violet McGuinness. Oh, magnificent flower paintings. And uh, that was the wife of the William McGuinness who won the Archibald seven times and uh, is not well known because he wasn't such a flamboyant personality as uh, some of his um, other Archibald Prize winning artists at the time. Uh, personality will get you known over talent quite often. And uh, we went to their home. They had a magnificent home in Ivanhoe, which I believe was a reproduction or um, a rebuilding of the family home in Scotland. I heard that the panels and the uh, ceiling rafters were brought out one at a time from Scotland all numbered so that they could be reassembled in Ivanhoe in Victoria, Australia. And this huge ballroom, it seemed, with the rafters in the foreground, uh, sorry, the rafters, I don't know why I said foreground, the rafters in the rooftop, and they had the oars from the canoes um, up in the rafters, just like they would have had in Scotland. And all the walls of this huge room, ballroom, which was became his gallery. They were lined with these portraits that William McGuinness had painted. And they were full-size portraits, people painted in real size, family groupings, businessmen, soldiers, famous people. And uh, I could relate somewhat to the family groupings. You'd have the big sheepdog on the <laughs> rug and the children standing there very formal portraits so and i found the portraits of the men very intimidating i was a child a seven-year-old a little bit afraid at the time and um yeah the full-size portrait of an intimidating soldier standing there full size you know looking at you magnificent portrait but a little bit terrifying to me so 
I wasn't overwhelmed by William McGuinness's portraits. I didn't really like that gallery room, but then I came into the family home and oh, I don't know the names of the singers now, but you would have world-renowned Scottish baritones singing the Highland songs and bagpipes playing. They were very much in love and carrying on their Scottish music tradition, their heritage. Um, my mother would even break into a Scottish brogue when she spoke and uh, we came from the Fife clan way back. But uh, in that home were the most magnificent flower paintings, mainly camellias and uh, assorted blooms. And they were painted by Violet McGuinness, William McGuinness's wife. And the backgrounds were dark. The camellias were extremely realistic. They would have little fans, um, little sculptures, ornaments, very much uh, the decor, I suppose, of the 1940s. They'd have dewdrops on the flowers. It was just like if you'd gone out in the garden, which was filled with camellias that she'd painted, and brought them in and put them in a vase, and they just looked so realistic. And I absolutely fell in love with Violet McGuinness's flower paintings and that's when I saved my pennies and um, oh I also made stuff I burnt I made a little fires a little seven-year-old in the backyard lighting fires to burn myself <laughs> charcoal getting scraps of paper out of the rubbish bin <laughs> so I mean I was keen I got an old shook shed and I converted it to a studio I turned an old wooden chair upside down and made it into an easel I got myself a Walter Foster had a paint book, which I think back then was five shillings, 50 cents today, so half of a dollar. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and that had a picture of a rose and it had a dewdrop on it. And at seven years old, I was trying to duplicate Violet McGuinness's paintings. <laughs> the world, one of the world's best flower paintings. At seven year old, I wanted to emulate it. <laughs> of course, I couldn't achieve it, but I tried I tried I tried oh I tried I got a job at eight housekeeping and cooking and cleaning and gardening and anything shopkeeping anything I could do I got work out to earn money to save money I had in my ambition to have my first set of paints my first set of paints was a horrible set of Mamero um, water uh, not China, Marie, Marie, Chinese watercolors, very opaque watercolors. Oh, I thought they were wonderful. That was my first set. I was probably about 10, 11 by that stage. And by the time I was 11, I turned up at the best art classes that one could have enrolled at at the time that I knew of. Swinburne Tech Night School Art School was taking student enrollments under Laurie Penderbury, the great artist who had been runner-up to the Archibald Prize several times, had won the Wynn Portrait Prize, the most revered landscape portrait, landscape prize in Australia. And I turned up and they looked at me and um, Laurie Penderbury was there. He said, I don't teach children. And I said, I'm not a child. And I told him what I had done working full time and the jobs that I'd done and how hard I'd worked and that I'd cut a lawn for somebody for five shillings that it, I'd had to do it with a pair of shears it was so long you couldn't get the lawnmower through it was a hand pushed lawnmower and I didn't have the strength to get it through so I cut that lawn with a pair of shears until my hands were bleeding with blisters it took me three days but I got that lawn cut and I told him what I'd done and he took me into his classes was 11 years old I was learning light and shade, I was learning life drawing, I was learning sculpture. I sculpted a ballerina, I learned how to cast a mould from a, ball you know, a ballerina sculpture that I'd first drawn from life. I am so grateful for the training that I've had and nobody ever turned me away from a class after that, <laughs> unless it was because I was an obnoxious student who 
acted like I knew more than the teacher, which I've done it a few times. I've not been the world's best teacher. I have a low tolerance for paying a lot of money for a masterclass and finding myself with a teacher that doesn't teach anything, that just says very nice, dear, very patronising to their students um, or is jealous because the student is doing a good job. I have a great deal of admiration for people who do pass on what they know and that's what I'm trying to do now. Um, I think it waffled enough and um, just ask any questions you'd like to know and I'll strive to answer them in another video and thank you so much for watching.